Today, we're going to break down how to get excellence in chemistry. We know that chemistry is a pretty intense subject, and getting excellences in chemistry can sometimes feel totally impossible. However, if you have a strong understanding of both the content and how to approach the questions, there'll be nothing stopping you from smashing your chemistry exam out of the park. In this video, we'll be discussing a few main pieces of advice that are super important for both Level 2 and Level 3 Chemistry. After that, we'll be looking at some specific excellence level questions from both NCEA levels to show you how this advice can actually be put into practice. There'll be loads of good advice scattered throughout this video, but feel free to use the timestamps so you can focus on what's important for you. We'll also be presuming that you've got the content down already, so if you're a bit shaky on some of the concepts, brush up on those with the help of a study time walkthrough guide if you need to. If you're aiming for excellence in chemistry, you're going to need to have really strong written answers. That doesn't just mean answering the question either. You're going to have to give sufficient detail along the way. When it comes to written answers, you'll need to use all of the relevant key terms correctly and answer every single part of the question. Many students will go into exams confident with the definitions they need to use and they'll give perfectly accurate answers, which is great. However, the tricky thing with NCEA is that you can give an answer that's 100% correct and still be capped at a merit. That's because NCEA needs an extraordinary amount of detail to really give you the excellence mark for that question, no matter what level exam you're sitting. When you're writing your answers in your exam, pretend that the person marking your answer doesn't know much about the chemistry content you've studied. Your answer should successfully explain the content that you've learned in enough detail that someone could get a pretty good idea of what's actually going on, without having to fill in any of the blanks themselves. It is possible to get excellence in chemistry without nailing the calculations, but you'll have a way better shot at it if you're more confident with the numbers. Even if maths isn't your thing, just getting halfway through the calculations can still majorly improve your exam marks. When it comes to chemistry, you'll never do any step of a calculation just for fun. Instead, every step is deliberate and represents a key aspect of an overall process, which could be anything from a titration to a bond enthalpy calculation. If you can understand these steps, then you'll be ready to tackle any problem they throw at you. For instance, some students will just learn the steps they need to do to complete a chemistry math problem without learning why the steps are important. NCA will try to catch these students out by giving them similar questions that scramble up the order of the formulas needed to work out the answer. Being asked to calculate hydroxide concentrations from pH is a key example of this. You might know how to go from hydronium concentrations to hydroxide concentrations and pH to hydronium, but NCA wants to know if you can complete multiple steps one after the other. That's usually the bit that trips students up if they don't understand why they're doing certain calculations. Also, NCA is strategic with how they give you the information in mathematical questions. They don't ever really give you information you don't need, so if you've got some specific details or numbers, be sure to use them. Sometimes, just noting down the information you have and what equations from the formula sheet use the same values can be enough to get the ball rolling. Another way students often lose marks is by rote learning answers for their exams, instead of truly understanding the process behind the answers. Usually, students will just memorise key phrases from textbooks or from exemplar answers, and this can create a false sense of security. If you know what to say, but can't effectively relate it back to the question, then you won't ever get full marks. For example, just knowing definitions and a few principles or laws isn't enough to get excellence. You need to have a really thorough and confident understanding of the concepts, and you need to demonstrate it clearly. For excellence, you need to make sure all of those concepts you're talking about are linked back to the question, and you won't really be able to do that if you don't understand the concepts through and through. Trust us, the marks can tell when you don't really know what's going on. We'll start out by looking at a question from Structure and Bonding to prove why adding enough detail is key for excellence. Sodium is malleable, whereas sodium iodide is brittle. Explain these observations by referring to the structure and bonding of each substance. This question is obviously asking about malleability, but if you pay close attention, you'll see that the question is also asking us to discuss structure and bonding. 
They're not just saying that because it's the name of the paper either, they actually mean it. We can work out straight away that sodium is a metallic solid and sodium iodide is an ionic solid. To get the excellence here, we need to link the structure and bonding of each solid to why that solid is or is not malleable. For sodium metal, we know that this compound structure is made up of lots of metallic cations held together by that sea of delocalized electrons which acts together as a sort of glue holding the solid together. We also need to state that the metallic bonds, otherwise known as the electrostatic attractions holding our cations to the nearby electrons, are non-directional. This lack of bond directionality means that we can move our structure around without it breaking, meaning that our metals are malleable. See how we discussed the metallic structure and metallic bonds and linked it all back to malleability? That's the level of detail you need for an excellence. We can use a similar format for discussing the malleability of sodium iodide too. Sodium iodide is an ionic solid which is structured in a three-dimensional crystal lattice with sodium and iodide ions alternating throughout the entire solid. Each sodium ion is held to an iodide ion with a very directional and rigid ionic bond which won't flex or move if we apply force to it. In fact, if we try to shape an ionic solid, for example by hitting it with a hammer, we'll just end up pushing one sodium solid next to another sodium solid and one iodide ion next to another iodide ion. Like charges repel, causing the entire structure to crack and shear into pieces. Again, this explanation is excellence level because it discusses both structure and bonding in lots of detail and clearly links both of these ideas back to malleability. In contrast, saying something like ionic bonds are directional so ionic solids aren't malleable is totally correct, but it doesn't have enough detail to get an excellence. Alright, let's ramp up the difficulty with a question from level 3 thermochemistry. Just as in level 2, the key to writing an excellence level answer is going into detail, almost like you're debating with the marker why your answer is correct. With reference to the relative strength of the attractive forces between the particles in each substance, justify that bromine has a higher boiling point than bromomethane. We already know that bromine has instantaneous dipoles, while bromomethane has instantaneous and permanent dipoles. We also know that bromomethane must have weaker intermolecular forces than bromine because its boiling point is much lower. These are accurate facts, but they're only constituting an achieved level answer so far. To answer this question fully, we need to state that bromine has a molecular weight of about 160 grams per mole, compared to bromomethane's molecular weight of 95 grams per mole. Remember that we can calculate these numbers by adding up atomic masses, which you'll see in the periodic table in your resource booklet. Because bromine has a higher molecular weight, it has a larger electron cloud than bromomethane, so bromine's instantaneous dipoles will be much stronger than the attractive intermolecular forces that bromomethane has. Because bromine has those stronger attractive forces, it requires more heat energy to totally overcome them, hence it requires a higher temperature to boil bromine versus bromomethane. See how these concepts link together to create a full justification for why bromine has a higher boiling point? That's what those markers are looking for. When it comes to calculations, we already know that the key is making sure our answers make sense considering what's going on in the question. This is a bit of a hard idea to get your head around, so let's go through a structure and bonding enthalpy calculation question as an example. Ethanol can be burned as a fuel. The equation for its complete combustion is shown below. Ethanol and oxygen react to create carbon dioxide and water. When 1.5 kg of ethanol is burned completely, it releases 40,600 kilojoules of energy. Use this information to determine the enthalpy in kilojoules per mole for this reaction. It's important to note that straight away the question is asking us to find out how much energy one single mole of ethanol produces. Let's start out by taking stock of what numbers we have to work with. We've got a specific mass of ethanol, 1.5 kg, an energy quantity, 40,600 kilojoules, and molar mass of ethanol, 46 grams per mole. Just from these numbers, using number of moles equals mass over molar mass, already seems like a logical move. But let's think about why that really makes sense. We know a certain amount of ethanol releases a certain amount of energy. That's why they told us 1.5 kg of ethanol releases 40,600 kilojoules of energy. 
If we can find the number of moles of ethanol in 1.5 kg, we can do some sneaky calculations to work out how many kilojoules of energy that a single mole of ethanol releases. All right, let's translate that into maths. Don't forget that the mass is always supposed to be in grams, so we need to convert that 1.5 kg by multiplying it by 1,000. So we have our equation, number of moles equals mass over molar mass. The number of moles in ethanol is equal to 1,500 grams over 46 grams per mole, and that gives us 32.61 moles of ethanol. That means 32.61 moles of ethanol makes 40,600 kilojoules of energy. Remember though, we need to find out how much energy just one mole of ethanol actually produces. We can work this out by dividing the amount of energy produced by the 32.61 moles of ethanol, which is 40,600 kilojoules by the amount of moles. So, 40,600 kilojoules divided by 32.61 moles equals 1,245 kilojoules per mole. But wait, there's more. To get excellence with these math-based questions, we need to do three things. Number one, give our answer to three significant figures. Number two, use the right units. And number three, use the correct plus or minus sign to show that it's either endothermic or exothermic. Without the three significant figures, units and sign, you'll be stuck at merit. So it's super important to remember this. Ethanol is a fuel, and we know from the question that it releases energy, so it's exothermic. That means that our final excellence answer is negative 1,250 kilojoules per mole. We can see pretty clearly how these questions become more simple when we isolate out the information we have, find a fitting formula to use, and apply a little bit of our reason to our calculations. By using the same strategy, we can even tackle the worst of the worst, titration calculations. Here is a level 3 aqueous systems example question. The titration was carried out by adding 0.14 moles per litre of sodium hydroxide to 20 millilitres of 0.175 moles per litre methanoic acid. The equation for this reaction is methanoic acid and sodium hydroxide react to create sodium formate in water. Calculate the pH of the solution after 28 millilitres of 0.14 moles per litre sodium hydroxide have been, has been added. Despite how complicated this question sounds, we can break it down by thinking about what's really going on and what calculations would make sense. We can see from the graph that the equivalence point was hit at 25 millilitres of sodium hydroxide added, and we know that we'll have an equal amount of acid and base present at this point. This means that the initial 25 millilitres isn't going to have an effect on our pH, because the initial hydronium has been neutralised with hydroxide. We can just focus on the 3 millilitres of sodium hydroxide added after our equivalence point. Well, we've got volume and we've got concentration, why not use number of moles equals molar concentration over volume? So remembering to convert millilitres to litres, we get the number of moles of sodium hydroxide equals 0.14 moles per litre over 0.003 litres, which is equal to 4.2 times 10 to the power of negative 4 moles. That's how many moles of sodium hydroxide are just sitting in the solution. This sodium hydroxide is not neutralised because we're past the equivalence point, so all of the hydronium has been neutralised. Now, our goal here is to get pH. To get to pH, we need to get a hydronium concentration, but to get that, we need a concentration of hydronium or even hydroxide. Specifically, we can look at the concentration of that 3 millilitres of unreacted sodium hydroxide in our titration flask. In the flask, we've got 28 millilitres of liquid, and we've already worked out that there's 4.2 times 10 to the power of negative 4 moles of sodium hydroxide in the flask. We can get the sodium hydroxide concentration pretty easily from here. Just by doing molar concentration equals number of moles divided by volume equals 4.2 times 10 to the power of negative 4 moles divided by 0.028 litres is equal to 8.75 times 10 to the power of negative 3 moles per litre. Sodium hydroxide is a base, so logically we can't plug this concentration into our pH equation since we worked out the hydroxide concentration. We can, however, use Kw, the equilibrium constant, to convert the hydroxide concentration into a hydronium concentration. That'll be perfect for the pH calculation. Let's condense this all down into one easy step. pH equals negative log of 1 times 10 to the power of negative 14 divided by 8.75 
times 10 to the power of negative 3 moles per litre, which is equal to 11.9. If we take a look up at the initial pH chart, 11.9 looks like the perfect answer for the pH at 28 millilitres. The last key strategy we'll focus on is understanding the processes behind your answers, as well as ensuring your understanding is well communicated. Using Le Chatelier's principle question from Level 2 Reactivity will give you an example of how you can demonstrate that comprehensive understanding. The following equilibrium was established in the laboratory by mixing iron 3 nitrate solution with potassium thiocyanate solution. Iron 3 reacts with thiocyanate to produce iron 3 thiocyanate. The forward reaction produces heat. Explain using equilibrium principles the effect on the colour of the solution if more potassium thiocyanate solution is added to the reaction mixture. This is the type of question where a lot of students might just rush straight in, have a vague yarn about Le Chatelier's principle, say that the solution becomes pale orange and call it a day. Unfortunately, just memorising that Le Chatelier's principle is all about undoing changes to a system in equilibrium won't cut it out for excellence. Instead, let's explain this process in a way that shows we understand what's happening. We know that the system is going to shift equilibrium to undo the change that's been made, so we can start by stating that in our answer. We can then say that the Ford reaction produces heat, so by introducing more heat by putting the reaction in hot water, the equilibrium will shift to use up that excess heat. The product, iron thiocyanate, will then be converted back into reactants, which are those iron ions and thiocyanate ions, as the equilibrium shifts to favour the backwards reaction. As a result, the solution will become less dark red and more pale orange. While all of these tips will help you ace your chemistry exam, the truth is you'll also need a really solid understanding of the content. So if you haven't already, crack out those study time walkthrough guides or your no brain too small revision sheets and get on it. If you combine some intense revision with the strategies listed here, you'll be well on your way to getting excellence in chemistry. Good luck and you'll do fantastic.